Hey guys, and welcome to Gwent, the Witcher card game. My name is Jagaris, and this weekend was the Team Leviathan Gaming Invitational, a massive Gwent esports tournament with a thousand dollar prize pool. The tournament played across two days. We went from 80 odd participants down to 16 on day one using Swiss format. Then we had a double elimination bracket that took 16 hours to complete, ending in a grand final winner who took home $600. During the weekend, I was commentating with Spiro, who is a, another Gwent commentator, and I did record a bunch of our games. So over the next couple of days for you, I will have some commentary videos showcasing some of the highest level of Gwent gameplay and seeing what the current meta looks like in terms of the tournament scene. In terms of factions, you will notice that there's no Skellige. Why is there no Skellige? Because why is there no Skellige? Because Skellige was universally banned. People kept banning Skellige because it is such a powerful list. But as a result of that, you should be able to see lots of spicy Northern Realms and Nilfgaard gameplay, along with some monsters and some Syndicate. Uh, so stay tuned and I'll get those games up and running. One thing just to be of note is that there was occasionally issues where... Spiro would see what happened before I did, just because of how the spectator client works. So sometimes he does react to things right before they happen. Uh, other than that, enjoy. And if you enjoy the videos, maybe leave a like. All right. So Cybers of Blue Coin is going to be Syndicate for um, Bayable and Northern or Northguard for um, Cybers. Let me just switch the perspective here real quick. I know, switchy. I guess I have to wait till the mulligan finish. <laughs> Yes, we've got to wait for the mulligans to finish before the mighty F4 works. Yep, so we got Pyreball's Blood Money uh, list. This is pretty much a standard list compared to last season. I feel like this list hasn't changed a whole lot. It is the kind of Passive Flora version with cards like Soul, with Adriano, with MK. It doesn't really feature, I think, any of the new cards. Uh, if it's not broken, I guess don't fix it. <laughs> yeah, definitely not that... Actually, yeah, no, no new cards at all. And... I mean, this deck does run a bomb heaver, and we'll speak about this a little bit earlier. Cybers, on the other hand, does run um, that Mask Raid Ball, which means that it's going to be incredibly useful for Fireball to find that bomb heaver, which he doesn't have access to just yet, but you would expect he should be able to find it at some point. And this interesting positioning from Cybers here coming in with this Magna Vision on the main area. Obviously, the Magic Lamp will eventually put a unit on the board, which will block the Magna Vision, but I guess Cybers wants to keep his range row it's open. Locked. Or something like a Van Moran Hunt, or maybe even a Purify with a Cup Bearer. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that, that's sort of the situation you often find yourself in playing this sort of deck. You play the Magni Division on the back row, and then suddenly they play something you want to lock, and you're like, dang. And then you just talked about Purifying. Here is, you know, the other situation where Magni is such a nice poison target because, you know, they can go, go so tall uh, over time, but they get played early, so they're an early target, which means that you often do need to find yourself purifying them with something like the Cup Bearer. So this setup does make sense. Yeah, definitely, definitely very true indeed. Um, that cup bear is gonna probably come down here soon and to purify that poison and keep this magna division alive and keeping that, that ranger open definitely turns out to be good news for cybers here. Deciding what exactly he wants to do, I think it's probably gonna be a cup bear, but we'll have to see. You kind of have to decide how many poisons does my opponent have, right? Because if your opponent has two more poisons, then the cup bearer is a waste. As it is, Pi only has the one more poison in hand, so this is uh, a great play. Um, from Cybers, you know, in, in purifying it, but you have to kind of make a call on how many poisons, you know, or what's the likelihood of my opponent having poisons. As it is, this deck does run, what, six poisons? You have the two Fistex Traffickers, the two Fistex, and the two Mutated Hounds. Yeah, I think there are quite a few poisons. We've got the Traffickers, as you mentioned. He has comes another poison from Pyreball. And yeah, there's plenty of poison in this deck. However, that poison does come down here. But looking at Pyreball's hand, he doesn't actually have another poison. Um, so this is actually potentially a little bit of a bait from Pyreball, trying to um, force Cybers in a weird position. Because this, this Traffic, if you poison your own unit, you obviously get three coins. Now, poisoning enemy units means you lose out in that three coin potential. And as we can see on Pyreball's hand, he hasn't got a follow up poison. So this Trafficker is actually just a bait. Poisoning your own card, though, against Nilfgaard is a risk, unless it's something like a Flying Redanian, where you can just thin it back out if you're at nine coins. Um, so it is, it is a bamboozle, but Paya, I think, with the state of his hand, doesn't really have many other options for things that he potentially wanted to play here. He has to kind of decide how he wants to commit into this round. And considering the rest of that hand is golden, you know, MK. The engine makes sense to get uh, to play here, but he's kind of maybe just seeing 
where Cyber goes and how Cyber commits before he plays too much more. And there's a very quick lock. Yeah, very quick lock indeed. Um, pretty easy target for that. I mean, Fireball can potentially commit Corkstein here to try a Purify lock. However, Corkstein, you would imagine, such a valuable card in this matchup due to the fact that this deck is quite poison heavy. And that Corkstein definitely could be a very valuable card later on. However, looking at Fireball's hand, he doesn't actually have really many efficient spenders for round one. You know, often you want to have things like the Street Urchin or the Jackal as good round one spenders. Yield a little bit committal, but it is a spender, so it's something that a Fireball doesn't want to commit in round one. Yeah, the hand is basically too good. So that's the kind of situation, and Pyball's kind of accepted that there's nothing really more he wants to play here. Uh, with that said, like Cybers was kind of getting to the point where he was going to have to start committing more into the round. So I think Cybers is going to be happy with the the pass here. And you saw him click the gin there. You know, he was kind of saying, "This is my pass." That's often kind of a signal for that. Is you you click the the gin to get the points on the board because you're typically looking to pass pretty soon. Yeah, and now we do see round two coming away. Looks like Pyball going to have to mulligan away that Flying Dane. Obviously, it is a card that comes out of your deck once you get to Horde 9. And um, not being able to be thinned out in round one, which means that it kind of costs Pyball a mulligan here as he's forced to mulligan away in round two. Looking at the other hand of things, Cybers now does have a pretty threatening looking hand, must admit. And let's see what Cybers going to do. Do you think that, that this, this North God deck is capable of taking Snicker a long round? Or uh, are we going to so see So this is where it gets quite interesting. Because if you look at Cybers' deck, he has precisely three gold cards left. He has uh, Fion, so he's got his Defender. He's got Afan, yeah. which he can thin out. And he has Masquerade Ball. Now, Pyable doesn't have access to Bomb Heaver. And on top of that, Pyable at the moment doesn't have his Passiflora to answer the scenario with a scenario. So if Cybers, uh, you know, feels like going into this round and kind of pushing, he'll some he'll reach the point where he can maybe start to see that Pyable is missing some tools. And comparing that to the state of Cyber's hand, even though he's a card down, I think he does have the potential in this situation to 2-0 just because Pyable's hand is quite poor. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting one indeed, especially what you mentioned with the Afan. It's always so weird when it comes to Roderick when you're playing with this Imperial Formation deck as you really want to you know, thin out that Afan before you play the Roderick to, to you know, get rid of that Afan and um, other... Because this card kind of pil pollutes your um, Roderick pool. However, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it pollutes your, your Roderick pool. And um, the thing is, is you don't want to use your leader ability in round two. So you can either maybe gamble on the Roderick and take the uh, the sixty six percent, or you can wait to round three and try to get a more consistent Roderick pull. But let's see what Pyable decides here. As he's going to go with Azar, and we're going to see a decline trip. just trying to get him up to six coins um, for now. Yeah, I think the the other tricky thing you have is that you are missing out on the Aristocrat tag on the Usurper and playing Roderick to play Masquerade Bull. I don't believe it triggers an aristocrat tag because you're playing the ball after the Roderick. Uh, so you'd have to make sure you have enough other aristocrats in uh, in hand if you're going to go down that route. Yeah, so now it looks like Cyber's going to decide whether he wants to keep going or not. Obviously, his hand is looking quite good. Not sure what he... I mean, if he does want to go, I commit you. I would imagine he's probably going to commit the Ramon mm -hmm. onto Roderick yeah. if he does want to push. But that's the question. Does he want to contest this round? Does he want to push it? Or does he think that round three is where his best chances lie. Yeah, this is where you're kind of like, at this point you've traded an Imperial Enforcer for Azar, which isn't a bad trade. Uh, but you, you do have to kind of make a judgment call here. Um, and yeah, he's opting to just go into round three, which has given Pyreball, I think, a little bit of an out, just given the state of his hand. Mm, that is definitely true. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, Pyreball does not have the Bomb Heaver in hand, which means that had Cybers found that Master Grave Roderick this round, it would be pretty annoying for Pyreball because he would not have a Bomb Heaver. However, playing Roderick would mean you have to commit both the Vincent and the Fergus to fully proc it. So, looks like round three will go underway. And there's the evolution onto the Usurper's Emperor. It's going to go to the final form here. And let's see what Pyreball can be able to find. Looking for a couple more golds. There's one of them. There's Fionn the is, of course, very hot. And that can potentially try to protect Py Py um, Cybers from that Bomb Heaver. However, Pyreball does have a Corkstein available to purify that, that Fionn. So... It will likely not be able to do that much. And as you mentioned, there's the Bomb Heaver ready to answer <laughs> the Smart Parade Ball. And that's where the uh, Kalkstein in round one would have been a massive overplay to unlock the MK, right? Because it's so good against defenders and poison that it's just a bit expensive here. Pyreball's hand, though, you know, he's still missing his passive flora, but he has found, found Vivaldi Bank, so he can go looking. But that, you know, you have to be a bit cautious because uh, it, it depends on the position of the passive flora within your deck. And he's just popping that straight off the bat he's just like i need to get those engines going and he did manage to find it uh somewhat near the top by the looks of things based on his gold so yeah I think how, many, gonna be happy how, with many, that. 
I think he had three coins in the bank, which uh, he was on. He, he was on four, so he went up to seven. Oh, so four, he okay. spent two. Okay. Uh, okay, so it was okay. It's relatively so cheap. It second top. Okay, so now we do see the Roderick into the Masquerade Ball guaranteed here, and here's what we're going to see: catch time. It seems <laughs> as Mom Heaver is going to come down and do its work, putting an end to this Masquerade he's, Ball. He's Looks like crash not the all party. <laughs> Yeah, just throw a bomb in the party, Monka S. Here we go. There's the bomb heaver. Looks like not all scenarios are created equal <laughs> as um, Fireball's going to have a much more threatening Passiflora as bomb heaver not. Oh, I get forgot about this. Braithens can, of course, play the um, Dutch performance and copy the bomb heaver. Looks like both players are going to be answering each other's scenarios. <laughs> forgot about this interaction that could, of course, happen. Braithen's being such an MVP in this situation. Yeah, it, it turns out, in fact, all scenarios are created equally in that they are all countered <laughs> by a five-point bronze card. Even if your deck doesn't run it, it's fine. You know, God, just do some shenanigans and everything will be good. Although, Pyable now kind of starting to assemble his seductresses. One of them quickly dealt with by Tony Joust. Um, and it, it's kind of Cyber's job to kind of shut down the engines here. But in doing that, he is also delaying play it to his own strategy with Imperial Forces and whatnot. Yeah, I must say, absolute insane Braden's value being able to copy that Dutch, that, that um, bomb here. And that's what I like so much about Braden's. It's such a flexible card. You know, you can just kind of do what, whatever whatever the situation um, desires. You can play either, uh, <clears throat> you can play something like a, a Major Trader or maybe an Emissary to keep an engine alive. Or you can copy one of your opponent's key cards or Dutch informants and get a little bit of create value too. And now we see Braden's getting boosted up already to seven after the bomb he was created this this brain is playing for such an insane amount of points um so far and it's going to get more when you have more create cards potentially that might come out from things like ramon so cyber is deciding whether he wants to protect this defender and how he wants to kind of uh position it in terms of the state of the board as it is pyable does have Kalkstein, so he can mm. utilize that to just purify it but then, you know, Kalkstein becomes a target because if you're running poisons, then you maybe want to get rid of it. But with that said, there's actually no more poisons because the Masquerade Ball has been uh, dealt with and Ooh. the fangs, I believe, are in deck. Yep, so there's no actual need to answer poisons. So Kalkstein is not that much of a threat after it deals with the defender, although opting to save it and go for the poison route. Why Why did Cybers boost the Fion to 9? That gives... It could have... I mean, Pyable could have taken a fill Was It gave it gave Pyable a perfect fill up onto the Fion. I mean, playing around, I'm not really sure what he was what he was worried about. Mm. There is blood money, but then it would have been seven with four armor, so it still should have been protected. It's a little, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of curious what, why that leader charge was committed. Not, not entirely sure about that leader charge, but interesting enough, it does get poisoned. Pyable does not take the Philipper onto the Fion, rather opting to keep the Philipper made for an enforcer instead, as we see now the defender finally going down here. And the question is, the Cyber is going to try and commit, commit more engines or does he want to start getting some value with this Enforcer before Philippa comes down or Airworld potentially? Yeah, Airworld is going to deal with all of those Enforcers quite succinctly. But with that said, it is delaying Pyre Bowl's soul, right? You know, it's not soul good if soul gets played very late because you want to maximize the amount of points before you start spending. So this would be the kind of situation where you do actually want to play soul because after that, you know, you're starting to spend money and you're seeing lower value from that. It depends how threatened he feels by these enforcers. And then... Mm, that is very clear. Maybe Pyre, maybe Cybers is trying to bait Pyreball into stealing the defender because he has a Vincent ready to go on a nine point defender yeah. had um, Pyreball decided to maybe steal with Philippa. But I guess instead Vince will be used with Fergus to maybe kill that seductress later on. And now let's see what Pyreball's going to be able to do here as he's got nine coins in the bank and ill available to him to potentially put an end to some of these enforcers. Yeah, I actually really like that strategy of trying to deal with the Philippa in that way because you're effectively making them spend a lot of money for very little gain. Uh, in terms of the Airworld, you do also have blood money available to deal damage to one of these targets. The issue is you're going to over profit, right? You don't have a spender to spend the two coins before you earn them. So whatever you do here, unless you play Philippa, you're over profiting. So you have to decide uh, in terms of the you know financial responsibility and, and making wise financial decisions, how you sequence this. Because Philippa, which we see here, is a good option to spend a little bit of money before you start earning money. Yeah, there it is. Philippa will come down as well as the other charge to kill off two of these engines. It means though Cyber still has a single enforcer left over, and that's going to put a lot of work in when you combine it with the likes of Fergus um, and this usurper. So that's going to be a decent amount of points for 
for Cyber Tier. The question is, what is the best invocation target? Right now, it looks like it's going to be a Slice Seductress, but again, that's also your best Vincent target. Yeah, that's the issue is you can apply the spying with Fergus, right? And it becomes a good a good Vincent target. So actually opting, I think, to he's going to invocate the uh, Seductress is what that tells you there by using the Vincent yeah. on the Thirsty Dame. And it does just clear up an engine, even though I don't think Pyre would have seen, you know, any more value from it in terms of tags being created. And that is a little bit of a late style coming down from Cybers here. Still will be safe. Um, from the likes of Fergus. Fergus will give this um, Enforcer three more charges, so it'll be at five, which means it will not be able to kill the Sal for now at least. And Cybers here does have that Corkstein, but really not much left to, to actually purify. You know, no more poisons for Cybers to be to be made, so I guess this Corkstein kind of just going to be playing for seven points, which isn't amazing, but isn't terrible either. Yeah, he's all good for now. And I think the thing with playing Soul after you've seen Vincent means that you know your opponent can't invocate one and Vincent the other, right? That's partly why the, the delay happens. So even though he doesn't seem like it's the going to be the biggest, baddest Soul that ever lived, at the same time, it's actually playing for points that aren't removed. So it's better than, it's, it's, it's better than playing it huge and then losing it, right? And now we do see Cyber still has that massive usurper finisher and a pretty big invocation. Fireball, I mean, his finishes aren't looking too great. He does have still six coins in the bank and a three point lead. I'm just not sure if it's going to be enough. He's also getting passive value here from this Sal, which will still trigger um, one more time at least. But I don't know. It looks like Cybers might actually have this one. Um, those bomb heave interactions, it looks like it looks like Fireball just really needed his passive order to stick, but unfortunately, Braden's giving Cyber such a flexible bomb heaver and now we do see Corkstein coming down where we will likely then see it as the finisher and, cons and let's see what has considering that Imperial Enforcer is just chilling he's got five charges he's just like I've, I've got 10 points you, you can't do you can't do anything about me so you've got five points in pocket on top of a 14 point invocation on top of a big juicy bearded usurper this looks like it's Cyber's game uh well Dean Dino, he's crawled out of the sewers. He showed up finally. He's gonna deal some damage, but it looks like it's too little too late. <laughs> yeah, look at the seven ping of damage <laughs> on the portal. What an engine. As a game number one will go in favor of Cybers, getting that first win through with his Nilfgaard deck against Fireballs. He, did, he didn't even need the Impera pings. He didn't use a single one of them. Like, that Impera was just for show. He's just sat there gaining <laughs> charges. Didn't even need them. He was just like, <laughs> at the end of the day, what, like a, a four point engine that didn't do anything <laughs> but didn't need to? Yeah, it's quite it's quite um, hard to restrain yourself from clicking that Enforcer. It's so satisfying just to absolutely unleash the machine gun of the Enforcer <laughs> when you get all those charges set up on it. Yeah, imagine having things to click and not clicking them in Gwent. I don't understand. Oh, yeah, a chat suffers from the same type of issue then. So, yeah, you see a boat, click a boat, see an enforcer, click an enforcer. See the board, <laughs> click the board, and then suddenly the portal is making horrible noises. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, right. I do like the new boards, though, the more interactive ones. Like, it, it feeds my need to click on things. <laughs> Yeah, there definitely are a lot of things to click on in the new board, especially the new portal, which is yeah, so nice to click it. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of audio bugs, so I kind of refrain from clicking it for now. But once that gets fixed, I'm going to be sure to you know change the board, the, the portal every now and then. Uh, but yeah, game number two will begin now. And let's see what these players start to queue in with. I believe Cybers this time will be on um, red coin, where Pyreball will be on blue coin. And let's see what they decide to queue with on these, these the, all these coin flips. I think it's, it was tough um, in... Well, actually, I was going to say it was, it was, it was tough playing playing on, on uh, blue, playing uh, Syndicate on blue, but actually it wasn't. It was Syndicate on red. It's just that yeah. Nilfgaard is such a difficult matchup because they have a lot of answers for the things that you're trying to do. And the, the utilizing the Brathens to not even need scenario removal is yeah, it's so, so cheeky. <laughs> it is. It does. It feels a bit gross. Like I, I mean, I love Nilfgaard, and even I'm a bit like... That's not okay. <laughs> that's that, it's, that's it, not okay. It's kind of funny. It's like North, North Glass is saying, you know what? I'm not going to run a bomb heaver. I'll just use your bomb heaver. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, why play my cards when I can play your cards? So Pyre will this time around playing Uprising on blue versus Cybers going for the Overwhelming Hunger monster. So NR versus monsters. We've seen this story once before or a few times before, Spiro. Yep, this is definitely a tale that was told many times yesterday. Northern Realms versus Monsters. Unfortunately, Monsters just not be able to find its footing in this matchup from day one. But maybe something can happen in day two. Maybe Cybers has figured out a way to win this match. But he does have Red Coin and, of course, Monsters. If there's one thing that Monsters is pretty good at, it's applying 
quite a lot of pressure in round one. Although looking at Cyber's hand right now, it's not looking too amazing. It doesn't have any larvae. It doesn't have any, you know, tall units. Bricks yeah. the um Winter Queen. Oh boy. Bricks the Winterkin as well. Now we see Fireball gonna lead right off with Amphibious Salt onto the Kirk Frigate. It is boat time <laughs> as that will be put on the board. And we will start to see some mighty boat clicking action any second now. Yeah, there's I think there's very little cybers can really do about this boat so this this round one kind of looks like one of those situations where you play three your three worst cards and then you pass but you know at this point what has pieball played he's only played a boat then he'll maybe play like a radovid raw guard and kind of see what happens so Paya is going to be able to by the looks of things win this round without committing very much unless cyrus can pull something out but i don't know what he's going to do yeah that's very dangerous for monsters because you know, you would expect Monsters has to win round one. And looking at Cybers' hand, I don't know if he's going to win round one at that hand. Fireball is a very strong looking hand on the other on the other side of things. Whereas Cybers, if he finds himself in a position where he has to pass round one and go into long round three against all these engines of Northern Realms, it might be disastrous for him. He's just missing so many round one tools. You really want at least one in Drega Lava to do the Thrive mm -hmm. things. You would want access to something like Maruna to maybe steal something from your opponent. You want the Apir and Phantom, also known as Steve, you know, just to have an engine of yourself. And then some toll units, maybe an Acre and maybe a Goliath. That's like your strategy round one, is you get a lot of value from your Thrives. You have a couple engines, you have a couple big boys, and you're setting up your graveyard. But in this scenario, yeah. Cybers is in a pretty sad position. And look at this armor going to tank up some of this frost here. So it looks like the Red Riders um, will end up only playing for six points, um, six for six on this range row, as you know, this armor going to get a little bit of value through that, as Pyable now getting three points turn of value and might start ramping it up with an Anna soon. If Pyable is in a position where he wins round one, it's going to be very difficult for Cybers to contest a long round three. So let's see what Cybers is going to do here. He does have that... Um, that bruiser, which you can use to try to disrupt some of these cards, you know, the movement can be quite valuable. You can move something like the Karak Frigate to the melee row, and then, you know, it's difficult to re-establish the soldier pocket sometimes. So let's see what, what um, Cybers decides to do with that bruiser for right now. I think this is so tough for Cybers. You know, I, I think his ideal situation would be if Pyre commits one or two more engines. So if he can get, get Pyre to commit the Ana before he pieces out of the round... That would be really good but like what do you play in this situation you have to do something to make your opponent play more cards because it might be the case that Pia actually thinks hey actually i'm getting this many points per turn do i keep playing yeah it must be said pipeball actually drew quite well he drew both the aneromancy and the infamous assault in round one and those are two cards you definitely want to have earlier rather than later as they are echo cards and this echo card does mean that once it goes to the graveyard it gets the doom tag and then returns back to your deck which means that you get to use it a second time so you always want to have these cards either in round one or round two and pyable luckily found both of them in round number one as now we see this character figure just <laughs> doing both things as we have now um, already spawned three volunteers and gonna be even more anytime now yeah pyable he did pass the boat clicking check you know that, that's a that's a check you have in there drug can <laughs> are you capable of clicking the boat it's got like the nice green circle there just to to remind you to click it and i think the shayla spent here is totally fine she's only a seven provision card so she's not a expensive gold and it also allows you to shut down another uh, well one of the brooks right so you shut down a thrive engine at the same time across two turns you're kind of threatening that um without committing too many more engines to the round because as the current state of the board is the friggin frigate and the drummer is just sufficient i must say great use of this armor by pyable with that um, red of a god applying armor to the frigate keeping it alive and taking some of this frost value which is just making this frost so bad for um, Cybers now, we do see the Bruiser going to be played for 7 points onto that Shiller, pushing into the back row, and also clogging up some space, making um, this, making, making this, this frigate a little bit more awkward, and I mean, it also, I mean, Cybers has the Weircat, Weircat on a, on a row board like this, um, as a punish, could be a lot of points, so, you know, maybe Cybers not out of the round just yet, can still try, you know, threaten some reach the, with that Weircat. The other thing I would say is, because Cybers is on red, he always has the threat of Acorn. Paya is like thinking, oh, if I pass now, Acorn will take the round. The thing is, Cybers doesn't have Acorn, but I think as a NR player, you always have to, or the player on blue, you always have to consider the reach when you pass. And that's why you see him continuing to commit into the round. He clicked the boat, he played the, the boiling oil there, he dealt with the Thrive Engines, and it's, it's 28 to 5 now. So, you know, you're, you're less worried yeah. about the Acorn reach at this point. 
starting to get very awkward for Cybers. Like, he's going to have to start committing some big cards here if he wants to stay in the shrine. Looks like the, the Wearcat will come down now, and that still threatens quite a bit, especially with the leader charge. Um, the question is, is Cybers going to use? No, he's not going to use leader just yet. And I guess Nugglefar could potentially, it looks like Pyable does take the pass. That's good news for Cybers. But how exactly is he going to take the shrine? I would imagine a leader charge onto the Wearcat, and or maybe he can do it. If he finds Nugglefar into Yigun, he could it's do it without there. having to. Yeah, it's a risk, but I mean, what else do you play? I guess you could use no, a leader charge to play a bronze. Higgin okay. doesn't do it, right? Because you would have the drummer ping. Oh, right, the drummer, right. Okay, you're, you're the, 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 absolutely right. The drummer does ping there. So yeah. it looks like it will just be done with the stat selection and a leader charge. Yeah, the, the little drummer that could. But, you know, I like that. I think, like, saving the Nago for, uh, for later on is good. And sometimes with this deck, you do end up having too many leader charges. So utilizing one there, I think, is, is pretty fine. Wait, actually, I think you would have done because the wake cap would get a thrive then. Oh, yeah. That would be one more <clears throat> Maths. It is a risk, though, because, you know, you have a lot of other gold cards <laughs> in the list. So if you miss it, then you're kind of a sad panda, right? Because then you still have to lose your yeah, charge. Right. Yeah, that is very true. So it looks like Cyber's going to take a safe option there. Does find the second and Drega Larva, and those are great cards to have here. Um, the question is, does he want to play both of them in round number um, round number two, or is he going to save one for round number three, perhaps, as we'll see what he decides to do. I would imagine he's going to push here. Definitely want to shorten round three as much as possible against Northern Realms like this, a deck like this. I think you really want to shorten round three, and I think if you really want to shorten round three, both of them are pretty nice. The thing is, if you play one of them, it's very likely that you'll see them get surrendered. Right? Because it's, it's a very yeah. e easy way to deal with two Indregas, so at that point, you may as well commit the second one if you're committing into the round. I like this uh, opening acorn though, just to maximize the armor on it and make it much more difficult for your opponent to remove. Ansays yeah, that would is do it. A... Actually, no, would, would, would Ansays die? How does that, how does that um, resolve? So, uh, if Ansays, yeah, Ansays, Ansays is suicide. If you use Ansays to duel uh, Yigen, your Ansays suicide. So it would damage the armor and then it would still start damaging the, the you know, base yeah. strength of Yigen. And then it would, it would be dead. And then only after the damage is resolved would Yigen die. Oh, well, this works. <laughs> Yeah, heat web definitely is a great way to answer. Now that means that um, Cybers has not got a graveyard set up yet for his um, Oswald finisher. And if Fireball is able to get final say, then Bloody Baron suddenly becomes a whole lot more menacing um, for Cybers to deal with because obviously Bloody Baron on an Oswald is just a, such a crippling um, amount, of, well, a point swing in favor of the Northern Realms player that you really need to try bleed, but at the same time keep final say because of the threat of Bloody Baron. Yeah, it depends how Cybers wants to go about this bleed. I think if you're committing to the bleed here, you probably do need to play both Indregas, especially against um, the kind of engine value. So uh, if you want to get your card back, at least. If you're not so worried about your card, you're okay. But yeah, Cybers deciding that he does want to commit the Indregas. He'll play them on the, rain, uh, the range row, yeah, because that does play around a surrender. Because I think at that point, you're just a bit sad if you played both Indregas on the same row and then they just all die in one spell <laughs> yeah. swoop. So, yeah, Fireball... <laughs> And this isn't bad, so I mean, Serena can still kill at least one of these. Like, this just yeah. this to me seems like a good render. I yeah, think that, yeah, yeah Fire, <laughs> Fireball's gonna take a surrender right away. I mean, look at the point gap now. Fireball's still earning two points to passively. It's gonna be more once this Anna is committed. And Cybers, I'm not sure how he's gonna do this. He's obviously got engines of his own, but like, what do you do against um, this frigate and? The Temerian or Temerian tri Tribe Infantry, rather, as well as the Anna, which could come down soon. I think you, you keep playing at this point. You can quite easily spend the Noon Wraith. You know, at this point, if you pass, you lose a card. If you play the Noon Wraith and they get ahead, you still lose a card. But you've played the Noon Wraith and bled another card out of them. So I do think you would keep going at least with maybe one more card. The question is, the only reason you wouldn't do that is if you want a longer round three. But the thing is, round three is not going to be particularly... Uh, impactful when you've spent both of your Indregos. And yeah, uh, Cyber's really saying, you know, I want to commit into this round. Oberon is nice with Thrives because the unit that you then play will trigger the Thrives twice. So you, you thrive quite a lot. It's a, it's a nice play. And maybe that actually would have been wiser earlier if, if only to protect the Indregos from the Surrender. Yeah, but at the same time, then you still develop the second Indregos if you want to. And then it looks like Incest is going to come down here without any leader charges. Will Pyable use the leader charge state? I would imagine he will. So there it is, going to use the leader charge onto the Triumph Infantry which keeps Pyable two points ahead for now. And Cyber's going to just play that Noon Wraith, going to get some value on the Thrives. But again, Pyable can quite easily keep himself in this round with the likes of Anna or Falibor even. Looks like Anna will be committed. No leader charges needed. And now Cyber's has the Nugglefall, which right now, you know, this queen, Winter Queen kind of polluting the deck a little bit. You do have the Haunt, which you can't pull right now. Godot is nice. 
Um, Maruna's nice. Audrell, Audrell actually right now wouldn't be too bad either considering you don't have final save, but there are a lot of bad options to pull there. Like Haunt, bad. Um, Dead Love, bad. <laughs> Audrell, okay. Goliath, good. Goliath, Goliath and Audrell are probably the two best right now. Yeah, I think even Maruna, if you can get the Ana or the uh, Anseys would be good, although there's a lot of volunteers to kind of dilute that. Uh, and actually, Golia, like you said, decent pull. You get the 12 points with the two Thrive ping, so you're you're creating a bit of distance. And uh, it, it makes Pyre's situation quite tricky, because if he wants to get ahead of you, he has to play Falibor. Well, he has to play Falibor anyway, right? Because otherwise you'd play Bomb yeah. and Falibor. Unless you use all your leaves charges. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a Falibor, but Pyabal will have final say and Bloody Baron in deck. So if Pyabal finds a Bloody Baron, I think he should be okay. But on the other hand, um, Pyabal doesn't have much left. He's got Falibor and Visigoth. That's about it. Whereas um, Cyber still has Oswald, still has Haunt, Haunt still <laughs> has uh, Maruna and Deadlove. So, you know, Cyber definitely has better hand quality potential than, um, than Pyabal does. However, Cybers needs to find some Deathwish cards for his haunt, otherwise this is looking like a very sad haunt. Well, the um, haunt again, is sad anyway, Pyble, so the bomb heaver, yeah. Yeah, the bomb heaver, yeah. So it doesn't actually matter. Pyable did not find the Bloody Baron. <laughs> that is a very sad looking hand for Pyable. Yeah, this um, is, this this is, is going to be, be a very close game. This is the, the interesting part, is the mulligan here, right? Because we haven't seen any mulligans from monsters yet. So he's kind of deciding, what answers does my friend have? Do I keep Osril? Do I keep the haunt? What do I keep? And that mulligan there for the Maruna is really nice, because look at all of these small value units. and. Uh, how easy is it going to be for Pyble to play around Maruna? He's got two leader charges. Oh, that's he... a great Maruna right. Okay. Oh, there we Looks go. Looks like Pyble's going to play around it. So, great way to play around it from Pyble, I must say. Pyble can actually make this Maruna very awkward for Not Cybers. With the now, we do see the. Oh, that is true. The Frost is definitely going to be quite helpful as that Winter Queen now coming out of the deck finally. I mean, I must say, I've seen this Winter Queen brick a lot of times so far in this tournament. Um, but this time, finally, it does end up coming out a little bit late, but better late than never. As now, Cybers will be able to use Maruna if he wants to, unless Pyble wants to play around with Leader Charge. I mean, he can play around it and force the Maruna onto the three, but you're still going to see Maruna value in this situation. If you're Cybers, do you consume the queen to just remove the bleeding if you're not going to see you're not going to see that much value from the thrives so and you've got an extra leader charge so it, at that point surely it's smarter to just utilize the leader charge also on the winter queen to uh remove the bleeding could be but i mean i guess that you can it doesn't really matter because the osra will thrive it up anyway so it still goes back to four um i guess, I guess, guess you're on the last turn yeah. Well. yeah yeah more or less same uh, thing it looks like cybers actually will take this one um wow i did not expect that honestly if you asked me how this game was going to go in round one i would have said my money's on, on pyable but cybers doing a good job with the cards he was dealt and staying in this game pyable unfortunately missing out on his buddy baron which is going to be such a sad thing to miss out on and this bomb heaver not going to find any value as Pi as cybers did mulligan away the horn preemptively i guess to play on this bomb heaver as Pyable going to be left with his four point brick card in round three. It looks like game number two will be all tied up. Cyber's getting his win through with monsters against Northern Realms, no less. Yeah, it did It did come down a little bit to draws there because if you've gotten the uh, Baron, that's what a 16 point play. So that would have put him ahead. Um, but as it was, Pyre just unable to find it. And the bleed really good because you got so many big tools out of Pyable for a short round. Like you got the Anses, you got the Falibor, you got the Ana. Like by going all in on the round, Cyber's really. Um, bled out a lot of Pyable's key cards and then not finding the Baron at the end was just the you know the cherry on the cake so that makes it two nil two cyber so Pyable if he wants to stay out of the losers yeah. bracket he's going to need a reverse sweep yeah reverse sweep what is cyber's remaining deck it's going to be um what was the last one it was no I actually can't remember no you already run with Nilfgaard I believe I mean, Northern so Ah, right, Northern Realms. So Pyabal's going to have to reverse sweep this Northern Realms deck, which, you know, it can be quite difficult. It's a mid-rangey deck, and, you know, mid-range decks are notorious for being you know, quite resilient to, you know, to, to, you know, targeting strategies, as it's going to be difficult for Pyabal to get three wins in a row now, but three wins in a row, it's going to have to be for Pyabal if he wants to stay in the winner's bracket, as game number three about to go underway. And I think the Werka actually really valuable if you look back at that match in round one, uh, being able to allow Cybers to take the round when he was that far behind just with the consume on the Werecat. This is, you know, the situation where Werecat does very well against the boat is sometimes you click the boat and you're kind of playing into your opponent's strategy. Uh, so even with a pretty awkward hand, I want to just commend Cybers for, for his round one because, you know, that was a tricky win for him. Yeah, that round one was definitely going to be very awkward. 
And um, let's see what game number three shows us as. We know that Cybers will be on will will um, be on Northern Realms. And the interesting thing now is Payable has the freedom at least of choosing exactly what decks he can queue into. The, so so Payable knows exactly what the matchup is going to be. He also knows exactly what the coin flip is going to be. So Payable now has a, has a small advantage to be at least being able to choose exactly what matchup he wants to queue on what coin. Let's see what Payable decides to do. Yep, he does also get two red coins, right? So Cybers will be on blue for this one. So if it goes to, you know, game five, then two of the red coin games would be Payas. Uh, this is where your players are choosing, right? The reason this countdown is taking a little bit longer is because I think Payable is really thinking about what he wants to queue. Cybers has one option. So assuming he is capable of clicking Northern Realms and thus clicking the boats, I think we'll be fine. Pyre opting for the Nilfgaard list uh, versus Cybers uprising Northern Realms. Uh, let's see what exactly happens here as game number three about to go underway. Let's see how it goes. Nice there. All right, game number three. It is going to be Northern Realms for Cybers, final deck for Cybers, whereas Fireball is going to be queuing in with Nilfgaard. And let's see how this game shows us. It's going to be an interesting one. I think um, I think this one could be quite close. This Nilfgaard deck is going to be a hefty Helga deck. But Cybus does run that Heat Wave, and of course, Heat Wave is a card that can you know, bypass this shield. Obviously, shield allows you to protect the Hefty Helga from an instance of damage, but this Heat Wave is not damage. It's straight up removal. Banish the card to the Nether Realms, and <laughs> you can be done with it pretty easy with that. Yeah, so Cybers going to be pretty happy with finding that. You might want to press F4, by the way. Uh, so Cybers will be on blue, right. uh, which means he should be the player closest to us um and Pyre then on red so you, if you're coming into the tournament the player on blue will, will try and keep at the front basically so that you guys always know who's been going first and who's been going second and the Karak cutthroat just had his cutthroat by a tourney <laughs> joust so uh cyber's slamming cards here he knows what he wants to do yeah i got a, I, I got a point one other thing actually Cybers does not run a purification card, which, well, not a decent offensive purification card. And that means that this Fion, the only real, there's two, there's basically two answers. There's either a Heat Wave or a Bloody Baron and hope that the bleed gets to it and kills eventually. So, you know, maybe Cybers won't actually be able to use a Heat Wave onto the Hefty Hulk if he's forced to keep it onto maybe that Fion instead. Yeah, you could potentially, I suppose, play Anses and Jewel. The th you have to use a lot of boosts on it, but uh, and Anses is the other answer to the the Fion. But the Fion could prove really problematic. It depends when Pyable wants to utilize that. Uh, <sighs> so Cyrus is deciding how he wants to react to the crossbow, and he does have the two damage on the Mola to remove the armor. But it's from there. It's like, where do you want to go? Do you want to click some boats or not? So far, oh, not. Boy, we're gonna so far not indeed i mean i think we've had our share of boat clicking action for the day in that, that first game but i mean i guess the famous salt is available in cyber's hands so at any point if he wants a boat he can be more than he can be um more than happy to assemble the fleet and now we do see the poison coming down onto that drummer of course cyber's does have that does have the um cursed knight which can transform the allied unit into a cursed knight which will remove the poison, but unfortunately it does mean that it transformed the drummer, which means you will no longer get that one point per turn um, boost from it any longer. Yeah, the drummer actually turns out he is cursed and <laughs> no longer playing a jaunty tune. With that said, it's a good answer. You're preserving the points and it means that playing something like tactical advantage isn't uh, so negative if your opponent is playing poison, right? Because TA is one of those things where as soon as you play it, your, poison, your opponent usually poisons that target if they have poison so by playing the uh cursed knight you are kind of improving the tactical advantage yeah i mean that poison i must say this is still playing for value even though it did get answered it basically denied cybers one point of turn so this fangs the empire still doing great work here and pieball still has got morale and other fangs in the hand so he can still keep poisoning and keep the pressure going i think that pieball wants to win round one get first say in round two and then push with the hefty helga as cybers might have a very difficult time dealing with it as we'll see what Pyable decides to do here. He's got that soldier pocket in the melee row, which means that he can play the Alba Spearman for full value. Uh, um, <laughs> Cyber's got to play first, though. So imagine maybe a Temple Guard. All right. All right, still Cyber's. Okay, we've got, we got some rope friends, it seems. Rope friends, yeah. Anna. Like... So, so I think this shows that Cyber's is, is valuing round one, but not using the boost I like uh, with this positioning, right? Because you don't really want to make the Cursed Knight any taller at this point when you know that your opponent is playing poisons. So instead of utilizing Anna for her full engine potential, you opt not to boost her and just boost on the right, and you still have that kind of one point per turn. She's like a, a drummer without a drum. <laughs> drummer without a drum, indeed. Rather... Uh weird spooky burnt hand um 
As Cyber's now, I guess he could use the Temple Guard to boost up the Ana next turn if he wants to. And let's see what Fireball is going to decide to do now. As he still has got um, the Elbow Sphere, which he can use to try damage Ana and keep it out of boost range. He decides not to do it, however, rather. He's going to damage the Mortar. Hmm, interesting. So this is where the Temple Guards actually would be quite good because you can slot it yeah we go next to the Anna and boost it and then you're putting the boosts onto different targets so rather than utilizing the uprising boost yeah. you wait a turn because you have a temple guard and yeah like you said pyable opting to kill the or damage the mola instead of the Anna. i mean potentially i guess he wants us to save the Anna as an invocation target yeah, let's see how Pyable decides to could invocate the Anna. It looks like he does take the pass, so Cybers does have round control if he wants to push in round two. Or maybe we'll see a long round three where Cybers tries to keep all of his removal cards for the likes of Hefty Hulga and Stefan. It's going to be difficult for Cybers to answer everything. Um, Pyable has got quite a few threats with the likes of his Stefan and Hefty Hulga as well as Defender. Obviously, the Heatwave is in hand, but Pyable can even play around this Heatwave quite nicely by using the Fion to boost up something else. And that's one of the big benefits of Fion is you don't have to use the boost on Fion. It's quite a flexible... Um, defender and makes it one of the stronger defenders in my opinion. Yeah, both players understanding the way that scenarios work. If there are no scenarios, you mulligan the bomb heaver and they both pass the bomb heaver check at this point. Uh, Falabor, a nice pick up there for Cybers. It does give him a bit more flexibility into this round, especially like looking at Cybers' hand state, there is a lot of gold. Pyre, on the other hand, doesn't have Helga but does have Royal Decree, so can go looking for it. Uh, so we'll have to see how Cybers feels about his long round versus Pyreball's long round. Nilfgaard long round is quite scary. Yeah, Nilfgaard's long round is definitely very scary, especially with Hefty Hulga. If you can't answer Hefty Hulga, we've seen it time and time again, it can absolutely obliterate the opponent's side of the board. So it is something that Cybers is going to need to have a way to deal with. But unfortunately for him, he needs to use his Heat Whip to answer the Fenders. Now we see, do see the Karak Frigate coming out with the Amphibious Assault. Wait, no, sorry, with the Neuromancer instead. Was that maybe a misclick? I think he might have once did the Amphibious Assault. Or... Yeah, opting to use the Neuromancy for the Frigate. I'm intrigued as I'm, to that I'm decision sure. i mean he does have another frigate in deck and he can mm -hmm. always use the amphibious assault on eggman but that's an odd choice yeah maybe maybe it's fine I'm not entirely sure i think that potentially was maybe i mean it probably was intentional um so let's see what cyber decides to do here as he does have amphibious assault available to pull out another character frigate if he wants to however um character frigate will get boosted up to seven which is not a bad poison target for the likes of morale and bangs the empire and cybers no longer has any more purification the the um curse light was spent so poisons will do quite a bit of work if they do come down so cybers has to make a choice at the moment he can pass and get his card back right he's played the frigate his opponents played the lock it's four for four so all things are even at this stage and this is where you have to think like am i happy with that trade uh do i want a longer round what am i afraid of what are my kind of major concerns with this matchup how do i lose um because if he continues to play here there's always the threat of losing a card. And yeah, Cybers thinks that, that that is a big enough threat to, I think, pass the round. So it's going to be a long round three where Pyreball gets first save with the likes of Hefty Helga, which is so scary, especially considering that um, that Cybers does not have a real answer. He has the heat wave, but he kind of needs a heat wave for the defender. Let's see what the top decks end up showing for Pyreball. Finds Ramon, obviously needs to find a bronze soldier to work with. Does not find a bronze soldier yet, although... <laughs> That is the Bronze Soldier, but Magna Division is not something you want to be copying with Ramon because obviously there is some big anti-synergy going on there. Magna Division has to be the only unit on the row. And obviously if two of them, there's only two rows in Gwent, this is not open beta, which means Magna Division, quite a little bit sad if you have um, to play two of them in round three. Yeah, Cyber is getting some sexy top decks there with his mulligan. He got a Neuromancy, unsurprisingly, and then ended up with Eggmund and Baron. So I think at that stage you're happy. The one thing you're missing is, is your Surrender. Uh, I don't know if you'd mind too much, because you can always find it with an Iromancy in the end. Whereas the Ramon Magni, oh, not so magnificent. I'm not feeling it. <laughs> not feeling it. It's not good. Yeah. Not magnificent indeed. As I mean, the Magna Division will... I mean, how does Pyable even do this? Like, he doesn't want to row stack his range row to keep this Magna Division alive, because if he row stacks, then then Cybers is happy enough to play the Surrender, which you can choose out, obviously, with the Iromancy. So... Pyable doesn't even want to roast stack, but at the same time, if he doesn't roast stack, then he's just played a four point Magna Division. So, what exactly is Pyable going to do about this? Like, he also has a three point Magna Division in hand, which he's going to just be able to have to play for three points at some time, which is definitely not ideal. Yeah, I feel like Cybers does not care about this Magni. This Magni plays into the surrender. So, you're quite happy to just be like, well, you're just kind of like blocking yourself with this play. So, you know, you're, you're, you're going to 
be kind of okay with that. But Cybers then has to decide, how do I want to develop my engines? Because ideally, if Cybers can develop enough of a board before Helga comes down, then he may have options to use things like the Visigod to remove it or to damage it or what have you and make life a little bit easier. <clears throat> Eggman. So it looks like Eggman is going to come down now for um, Cybers. And Pyble going to take the invocation right away onto that, putting an end to that engine um, for now as... And this hand is looking very awkward for Pyball. Still doesn't even have the Hefty Algo, nor does he have the Stefan. So he has to roll the Kree into Stefan and hope the Stefan survives, which he can roll the Kree out the, the um, Hefty Helga. But that loses him his double bribery as well. So, man, Pyball just really suffering from some awkward mulligans here in round three. Yeah, and that's a really greedy way to draw, right? If you uh, if you do want to roll Decree into Stefan in order to then roll Decree Helga, you're also losing out on a bunch of tactics. In which case, is it even worth it? to play the Helga? You know, you, at that point, how many tactics do you have left? Because you probably would have played the Defender anyway. So you're only getting plus two from the Helga on the bribery. Uh, in which case, I feel like it would be much more worthwhile with this Royal Decree to use it for something like the Stefan into a double bribery, if you can get it to survive. Yeah, let's see what happens here as Empireball has a very awkward hand to work with and Cybers pretty much has a near perfect hand I would say. It looks like a Fibre Assault will come out to pull the Karak Frigate once again. We see the boat coming out and Fireball has got poisons. Poisons can deal with the boat. That's an efficient way to deal with do it. And I think that's what we'll probably end up seeing very soon. Looks like either a uh, um, Morale or uh, Fangs the Empire most likely will be used to answer that all. Yeah. If you if you do poison the boat at least Cybers, he gets to click the boat at least once. He gets the satisfaction of at least one boat click. So, you know, poison, although it does in fact sink the friggin' frigate, you, we do get the satisfaction of watching Cybers click this boat at least once. Come on, Cybers. Yeah, I've, always, I've always wondered how you end up poisoning boats and wind. Such a strange concept to me. You poison all the crew and then the boat sails into a rock and sinks. It's it's a it's like a it's like a proxy <laughs> sinking, right? <laughs> that's, basically, that's basically how it goes down. You know, it goes down because because it sinks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Just just, <laughs> just stop. So Cyber is having a big think before he clicks the boat. He knows that he has to click the boat, but in the meantime, he can utilize this time to decide uh, where he wants to go from here and how he wants to develop his side of the board. The Aniromancy has access to engines, but also to surrender. So maybe saving that instead for when your opponent has stacked the back row. Click the boat, pass the boat, click and check. Where do you go from here? I mean, I'm not sure where Payable goes from here. He has to play Royal Decree onto what I think is going to have to be a hefty Hulker. But if he does that, then he just misses out on the Stefan. So he might have to play Royal Decree on the Stefan instead to pull out the hefty Hulker. But at that point, all the tactics have pretty much been used, which makes the hefty Hulker just so much worse. So I... I'm not exactly even sure what Payable is going to decide to do there. I really like this from Cybers. He utilized the leader charge on the volunteer plus the ranged row Visigurd. So he's basically setting up so he has the ping to remove the shield of Helga if mm. it gets played. And then he can utilize Ansays to duel the Helga. So he's kind of set up the board in such a way that if Helga comes down, he can deal with it. Um, and I really, I like this sequencing, right? But the thing is now that there's the poison on the board, you have that threat um, of potentially another poison. I'm not entirely sure where the situation is. Actually, no, I guess you wouldn't be worried about the poison. Oh no, Cupbearer, I tell a lie. So yeah, yeah at Cupbearer, this point you Cupbearer. then have to use those charges. So the morale forces Cybers into position where he does I, I have to guess play the charges. what Cybers could do is he could use only two of the, okay, looks like he's gonna use none of the charges at all. Um, <laughs> interesting that he's not gonna, I mean, I guess the morale is ranged. I mean, of course, morale is not Oh, he's role locked, locked, isn't he? Um, yeah. Yes, so. I'm kind of surprised that Pyable actually ended up putting that on the, on the range robe there because, I mean, this Maga Division, although it is getting boosted, it is going to give a good blade brand for Cybers anyway. And the more he row stacks in the back row, the more value he gives to Surrender. So I really don't know if I like Pyable's row stacking this much. Um, as we now do see the Braithen's going to be played onto a Mage Infiltrator, damaging both the Visigod as well as the Blade Baron, and maybe threatening um, Cybers who perhaps either use leader charge to boost him up or use those um, charges. He's kind of got to just decide what he wants to do with the with the charges. And he's, he's still happy to save them for the time being, well, last round, because it was a tactic against Helga. But now that he's down to three, you know, he's a little bit more threatened in terms of ways to remove things. So it may utilize those charges. There's no really good target, right? There's not, nothing on the board you really want to be hitting. I mean, you could just use the t points for damage, in which case, you know, you want to hit something... I guess relatively tall, so that if you do use surrender, you're not wasting points. You could set up yeah, a, a fallible, right, onto the fangs and the morale, but in doing that, you are countering your own surrender. Yeah, this is just looking like a such an awkward situation for um, for 
for Pai able to be in with this hand. Looks like Cyber's going to spend the charge with the Visigod right now and say to himself that, you know what, I'm not even going to play around this Hefty Helg anymore because surely he would have played it by now if he had it. And now we do see Cyber's going to use a leader charge onto that um, Bloody Baron, keeping it out of Tony Jaws range for now and um, still threatening a, bit, a big reset onto this Magna Division. And this point, Pyabal really needs to stop stacking the Ranger. If he stacks anymore, the Surrenders is going to become such a nightmare for him. The thing is, though, if he's playing Stefan, he has to stack the Ranger, right? He has to play Fion, and then he'd have to play the Decree into the Stefan onto the Ranger. Like, you don't really have a choice in that situation because Stefan is row locked. And Cybers does know that one of Pyabal's cards is a three-point Magni Division, right? So he, he's fairly aware of, you know, where this, this may go. So Fion onto the Ranger, again, that tells you, right? That tells you I'm going to play Stefan. Because otherwise, if you're going to play Helga, you would play it on the melee row because you're playing, you know that your opponent runs Surrender. And there's a... Yeah, a very quick heat wave. Hmm. Just yeet the heat wave. Fireball didn't try and play around that um, heat wave. I, mean, I guess he plays into Unsays then, so I guess it makes some sense. But now um, that Unsays could be used to duel off maybe something like a Stefan if Fireball is not careful. It's going to use a lot of leader charge to keep it alive. And I mean, Bloody Baron is on the board ready to go. So if Fireball even boosts up that Stefan a lot, Oh, he finds the Unsays. That is such a... Oh my goodness, that Unsays is going to... I mean, this is actually huge for Pyable because what Cybers could have done was Cybers could have floated this Bloody Baron. So if Fireball boosts up the Stefan to keep yeah. it out of... um To keep it out of Unsays range, Fireball... I mean, Cybers could have reset the Stefan and then dueled it with Unsays. But now that Fireball rolls the bribery into an Unsays, he can kill the Bloody Baron. Denies him so much points in the Baron. And now we see Ranger Unsays coming out from Cybers for now. I think with the, the Ranger on says I guess you're just trying to get that extra point so you have a bit more dual potential. Uh, in terms of the Aniromancy, if you can make that Ansays even taller, then you can still deal with the Stefan, right? So that looks to be what Cybers is setting up for. You've got one point from that uprising, bringing it up to six. If you run Aniromancy into something like the Radovid's Royal Guard, you bring it up to eight, and that gives it a lot of dual potential. You sacrifice your... Uh, surrender, but actually, Fireball, you know, recognizing that with the Ansays, he's recognized that this Ansays would just kill Stefan, so I may as well take the value play that is Eggman instead. 34 yeah, to 9, say, though. I gotta say, Fireball's done an excellent job at staying in this game despite his very awkward draws in round three, missing on the Hefty Alga and the Stefan, as well as the Cupbearer and Meno. I mean, Fireball definitely has got was on the back foot here, whereas Cyber's drew quite well. So, must say, very well played so far from Fireball, keeping himself in this game. I mean, it's not over yet. Cyber still has this massive fallible, still has an unsafe to do four damage, and a Neuromancy to two throughout a surrender. And Fireball's stuck with a three point dead Magan division. So <laughs> but he does have Afan, cool. right? So, we still have the, the leader charges, and mm. that is a pretty big play in and of itself. It's going to be nine points. Uh, you're going to see full value from this fallible though if you utilize the ansays onto the opposing ansays and demand satisfaction that makes it a two which means the fallible can make quick work of that although actually giving yeah. your opponent time to play around your fallible here and there is the looks like it is going to be a royal oh not royal clear rather but an year mancy onto the Rabbit Royal Guard, which means he can boost up this and says, give it a little bit of armor, which gets a more efficient duel. Here comes the final leader charge. He's going to pull out the Afan. That is a massive point gap for Cybers, I mean, for Fireball. I'm not sure how Cybers is going to do his points. I mean, he still has a pretty big um, Fallibor. This Ancest is going to do some work. There's the leader charge. It is going to be close, but I think that Fireball, I think he has this one. Very close, however, and here is the Ancest, and there is the Fallibor, um, or Ancest rather, not actually, actually not actually that close, but definitely well played from, from, from Fireball, despite the very awkward hand round three. Still yeah. takes the win here, and gets his first win on the board in the series. I am wondering about the Radovids, you know, playing it to get the duel on the Ancest, was that necessarily worth it? You did get an extra point on your Scytheman, but considering how stacked the rows were, your Surrender's still playing for a decent amount of points. I mean, I don't think ultimately it would have won him the game, I'm just wondering, you know, that's one of those games where you go back and you're like, okay, if you on Neuromancy, this, is it better? If you play the sequencing like this, is it better? Because in delaying, he actually lost points from his Fallibor, right? Because he did have a full value Fallibor if he'd used the Ansays just for four damage, and he opted not to do it. So I'm not entirely sure. You have to go back and do the maths. I must say, it was an excellent game of Gwent. Despite the fact that the bribery definitely had, had a say in the outcome of that game, I would say. Um, definitely was an exciting game nonetheless. Um, so let's see what happens in game number four. As Fireball finally gets his win through um, with that Nilfgaard. And now still needs to beat this Northern Realms deck twice more if he wants to stay in the winner's bracket. And now Pyable will have a blue coin. So let's see what Cybers is going to be able to say about that as Cybers will queue in with Northern Realms once again, obviously. 
Yeah, so this time around Pyroball will be on blue, which means he maybe won't be able to utilize some of the bully tactics that Redcoin does have. Redcoins are such bullies. Like, it's not cool. Play nice. Stop forcing your opponent into losing on even. <laughs> I hate losing on even. Oh, it triggers me. Well, losing on even definitely something you do not want to be having happen in Gwent. Let's see what happens now in game number four. Those players are going to be... Pyroball does have the luxury of knowing exactly what his opponents are going to play. So he can choose exactly the coin flip of these remaining two decks and what he wants to queue in with. So let's see what Pyroball decides to go with as Cybers will go in with Northern Realms guaranteed. Hmm. I think when it comes down to the bribery though, you know, it was big that he killed the Baron, but then he didn't end up playing Stefan anyway. So the question is, if the bribery had been worse... Does it matter? It's interesting he won that without using Stefan and without using Helga. You know, two of the kind of big tools in the tool belt ended up not actually coming into play. So this time around, Pyable going for Northern Realms. It is the Man. Northern Realms grudge match. Full Man. test. This I like versus Hensel. <laughs> Who's gonna I win? mean, this is going to be a this is going to be almost identical. I think of Mura. So I think there might be. Maybe, no, I'm not even sure. It might be card for card exactly the same. I'm not even entirely sure. This is going to be very, very similar decks, if not exactly the same. I think that Pyreball does run Sheila, whereas Cybers does not. So that like, this is a little bit of a difference. But other than that, pretty much straight up mirror match. So this is quite an interesting situation in terms of mirror matches because with an engine list like this, going first is really nice, especially when you have the tactical advantage. So you can see Pyreball opting to run this list on blue uh, in the mirror is powerful because it means he has first say, which means he can develop his engines round one. And then if you win round one, you'll often see the player actually really push round two. Uh, and with these kind of mirrors with engine decks, there's often a 2-0 because your opponent is always reacting to your engines and always trying to kind of chase you. Whereas um, you are quite free to then set up engines as you as you see fit. So round one, really crucial in this in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's an interesting one. It's not a full on engine deck, but it definitely has got quite a few. It definitely does have quite a few um, engines, plus some you know good mid rangey cards. So it is going to be a kind of hybrid between the two. And we'll see how the players adapt to that as we now see Fireball going to develop the um, Frigate on the board. And I think Cyber is likely going to do something very similar. Uh, he does have Amphibious Assault. Fireball does not have any of his Echo cards. So it's a little bit unfortunate for Fireball to miss out on the Echo cards so far. Um, but of course, you can still find them in round two and still be okay, I think. I need the player having their Surrender either, which is a very vital tool uh, against these Frigates because you can just wipe out all of the voluntary uh, crewmen and just completely decimate the row. So I think both players unhappy that they don't have their surrender at the moment, but happy that at least their opponent doesn't. If, if they do, which they don't, but you know. I'm happy for them. <laughs> and there is the random ping of that um, of that Triumph Infantry. Unfortunately for Pyreball, ends up pinging the armor, so gonna lose a bit of value on that. But right now, Frigate on the board for Pyreball. Um, no Frigate on the board for Cybers, so looks like Pyreball is gonna take round one pretty easily as he will have the choice now of whether he wants to bleed round two and make use of that first say, or maybe he wants long round three with final say. So let's just see exactly how much Pyreball um, values first say and whether he's gonna push round two or not. And there is the Surrender, very valuable card for trying to counteract some of this Frigate value. And let's see if Pyball can find any of his Echo cards, which I think he's looking quite... Um, there it is. There's uh, Fibber Salt. That's great, of course. Um, still does not have the the Neuromancy, but of course, having the Fibber Salt is a great card to pick up in round two. Yeah, I think Cyber's just respecting, you know, the friggin' Frigate, the Drummer, and the Tridom engine power compared to his board state just saying, I can't I can't beat this, so I may as well pass and go into a, into a longer round. I mean, he could try, but damn, I don't think he would have, have won that round. So, like you say, <laughs> Pyre does need to make a decision. How much do I value first say with this hand? Uh, how do I feel about the long round when I've spent slightly more engines? You know, where do I see this going? Uh, at the moment, he can afford to just play cards. You know, he can play at least one card and see what happens. Uh, down to seven at this point, and he's opted to Amphibious Assault. Yet another friggin' frigate. Will he click the boat? <laughs> Exciting. Look at the other side of things. I mean, Cybers is a pretty good hand as well. However, he is missing out on as his Neuromancy as well as his Surrender, which is a pretty big card in this in this mirror. Um, obviously, these frigates do end up swarming the board quite a lot. So that Surrender can be quite valuable that, but no Surrender for um, Cybers. Fireball, on the other hand, does have the Surrender ready to go. So if we do see a Carrick Frigate from Cybers, Fireball shouldn't be too concerned about that, I would say. Yeah, the Surrender. This is where I was like, I'm happy for both of them, and now it's not looking so good. Karathi Heatwave being utilized to banish the Frigates to the Shadow Realm, uh, and Pyable snap in the pass on there. I think he's happy with that trade. 
Yeah, it does trade quite well on that because he will still get back his Amphibious Assault, whereas Cybers will not get back that Heat Web. And now we're going to go into long round three. However, this time um, there is a little bit of downside for Fireball. Cybers will have first say. Fireball will have final say, though. Final say can be somewhat valuable because of the likes of Bloody Baron. Um, but first say also has its own merit. So let's see what the top deck show for both players. Is Cybers still looking for that surrender and a Neuromancy, whereas Fireball does top deck into the Amphibious Assault, obviously guaranteed. There's the Neuromancy yeah. for Cybers. So the Neuromancy, a big pickup because you can utilize that to draw into Surrender. So if, even if you don't find Surrender, you have well, access to it. This card's so flexible because it plays any card from your deck, not like Royal Decree, which only plays a unit. Uh, Carrot Cutthroat being mulliganed into a Scytheman. Scytheman's not bad. You can see some very big Scythemans in Northern Realms. It just depends on when you time it, right? Because you need to play it before your opponent maybe damages a whole bunch of units and removes their boosts. Yeah, I mean, I must say, going back to the Neuromancy, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like Land of a Thousand Fables and Royal Decree packed into one with the advantage of the fact that it's also Echo card. So if you draw this card early on, it's such a nice card. It becomes a little bit worse when you draw it only in round three because when you draw it in round three, obviously, you're paying 12 provisions for kind of a, a exaggerated Royal Decree in a way. But um, other than that, it is a pretty good card when you do find early on. Unfortunately, for Fireball, he does not find his Neuromancy. Um, but he does have an Anna String in the deck, and that is not a bad target for Amphibious Assault. Obviously, we'll get boosted by two from that um, provision discrepancy. So it comes down as six points, and obviously with two boosts. Interesting. So this is where Cybers has started to develop his engine, and Pyat needs to decide how he felt about the Tridam. He did have Anse, so he could answer the Tridam uh, with a quick four-point removal as it wasn't boosted, but opting instead to play the Shayla. This does mean that Cybers does have a target for things like Eggmund or his drummer, and he will see some value off of their boost. Uh, and I think this is interesting with Pyreball. I suppose with the Tridam, it's like if your opponent does boost it very, very tall, it gives you a fantastic heat wave target and a fantastic Baron target. So maybe you're not too worried. But with that said, all of those boosts still equate to damage. So, you know, if those boosts went el elsewhere, it's kind of the same. Oh, we had Jagger Scrub. Um, I'm here. One sec. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I just cut up for a second. There we go. Oh, I was talking about engines. <laughs> I was, yeah, just, 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 uh, yeah, all I said was he could have removed the Tridam with the Anses, um, but maybe opting to save that for a bigger target. But it does mean that Cybers can set up a Drummer or Eggment, which is what he did. So Yeah, Eggman does come down now to remove that. And now uh, Cyber's getting a little bit more board control than Fireballs. Of course, Falibor could come down potentially right now and answer that Triumph Infantry. It looks like it's rather going to be a Mauler for the time being for Fireball. So let's have a look at both players' decks. Fireball missing out on a Neuromancy, not the end of the world. And Cyber's missing out on Falibor, Visigod, and Serena. So I would say that um, Cyber's having a little bit of a worst hand, but um, we've definitely seen players in this tournament so far at least. Having been able to come back from that first say obviously does give Cyber some small advantage, but let's see if it's going to be enough of an advantage to make up for that draw discrepancy. It's quite weird though, you know, in the current situation, Pyre hasn't answered any of the engines. I mean, he does have the damage, he's kind of saved that, so maybe he's trying to set up a fallible where he can answer, you know, multiple engines at once. But at the moment, there's Anna, there's Eggman, there's Tridam. You know, there's a lot of engines, and there, there's the fallible, but with the way that that was played out, it still only answered one engine. Maybe I mean that was a very good answer on obviously dealing with an Anna is so much value, so fantastic fallible value there from Pyable as Cybers now starting to maybe fall behind a little bit, but yeah. we do see the, tri the um, drummer being used on this triumph infantry and Pyable. I guess he could use an Unseas potentially that could answer this drummer. I would expect to probably see an Unseas coming down run about now, but we'll have to see. But at this point, that Tridem has gotten a lot of value just in the damage pings, right? We've seen him ping every single turn since he came down. Like, damn, he has put it in work. And again, there's still two engines, you know? Pyroval started to answer engines, but has he left it a little bit late? I mean, the point gap is, you know, in favor of Pyre at the moment, five points. Uh, but what has Cybers played? You know, we've seen Falibor and Anse has been played by Pyroval. Yeah, it's also important to note this random damage from this Trident Infantry is also quite valuable in the fact that it puts damage units on Fireball's side of the board, which makes, you know, his Visigod and Scythemen potentially a little bit harder to set up as you no longer can just get these this Falibor and this um, Mauler up to boost his strength um, with the help of Elite Ability so easily. So now let's see what Cyber's going to do. Cyber still has his God, um, his Falibor and Anseas, but he does have to choose now whether he wants to take Falibor, Visigod, or Surrender, which are such important cards in this matchup, which he's going to have to sacrifice um, two of them. 
Or oh, actually, I guess only one of them. You can, can use Amphibious Assault to pull out the Visigard at least. So you have to choose between either Falibor or Surrender. Yeah, and I think actually using Amphibious Assault for the Visigard is really nice. Uh, actually, I guess opting not to play Surrender this round, using the Neuromancy here for Falibor. I, I like it. I, I think if you're not running boats, if you're not using Amphibious Assault to play the Frigates, then sur the Surrender value is much, much lower. Uh, so by playing like this, he's kind of said, I'm not going to play any boats. I, I know you have the counter to my boat strategy, so I'm going to counter your counter by not playing it. Yeah, let's see what um, Cybus decides to do now as he is going to have committed his fallible, which means he will no longer have access to that um, surrender and payable. Looking at his side of the board, I mean, he's got heat with not sure what the best heat with target is going to be right now. I guess maybe a sightman. There will be two sightmen for Cybus to play. Um, but I'm not entirely sure we'll see with that. And also the surrender. I mean, there's no frigates being coming on the board, so the surrender might not be that amazing. We do see Amphibious Assault coming out now from um, from Cyrus. Uh, never mind. There's a frigate. Looks like surrender is back on the menu. Yeah, I was just say I was saying that you might opt to not play the frigate because you know surrender is a thing. But uh, Cyrus, I guess instead of sacrificing his Visigard and going for the the friggin' frigate instead, he does have the soldier set up with Falibor. Um, so he does have the little crew pocket, but, you know, if Falibor gets removed, what are his options? I guess Baron is a soldier? Here is the Anna. The question is, is Payable going to Heatwave the... Oh, actually, I actually really like this from Payable, using the Rat of a Drill God onto the Anna String and making it, un making it unsafe is pretty much impossible to kill the Anna. Of course, Cybers can use the Blade Baron and then combine it with the Unsayers. But that takes a lot of work to get through this Anna, so very good use of this Radivator God from Pyable, making that Ancestral just not possible right now. I think you have to Anna it, right? You can't you can't just leave or Anna it, Baron it. I think you can't just afford to leave it uh, with that many points. Uh, the Ancestral, like you say at the moment, isn't going to be able to cut through it, which is pretty bad. But then if you're going to Baron it, ideally you would want to, I guess you could play Baron Melee and then boost him. But then you get your... Scytheman, not quite at the value that you would necessarily want. You maybe want him to be a bit bigger, but yeah, Anna's just too much of a threat. You have to respect her. And there oh. is the Blade Baron putting the Anna back down. But of course, Pyable could use Leader Charge to boost it back up if he wants to. Um, and of course, Pyable also has a Heat Wave, which he can also make use of onto the Karak Frigate if he wants to as well. The question is, does he want to do it? He does take the Heat Wave onto the Karak Frigate and does use the Leader Charge onto the Anna. And says, I think, still can do it at seven, at seven effective health. Um, the Ancest will be able to do it, but that means he's got to use his last leader charge, which means that he exposes that Scytheman early. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter too much, but there it is. Ancest will come down now to finish off this Anna. Yeah, saving saving the leader charge for that instead. These uh, Scythemen, not that big though. You know, there's really not a lot of boosted units, so you're not seeing great value from the last couple cards in Cyber's hand. He is up in points, but Pyable does have, there you go, four boosted units on the board at this stage. His Visigurd, you know, is pretty big. Uh, and the way that the units were positioned there, I'm a bit confused. I guess like, you know, you, you disable the Tridam. Cyber's disabled his own Tridam, which would have, you know, helped him counter some of these. Um, disable his Tridam, why? The Eggman's not ticking or use the order. Oh, no, use damage. Yeah, there we go. I'm, yeah, being, yeah. I'm being a numpty. That's fine. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the, the... Surrender and Visigurd with five pings versus Boiling Oil and, and Yeah, uh, I think this, this should be a win for Fireball from what I can tell. So, looks like this might all be tied up as game number five might happen here. Payable's final deck is, um, I think it's Syndicate, which we might see Syndicate on Raidcoin versus Northern Realms deck, which seems to be the case. It's all tied up. Scores have been tied. Um, let's see what game number five is going to show us. Yeah, that Royal Guard onto the Ana was... It just spelled disaster because he didn't have a good way to deal with it. Like, I really think Payable with that play, uh, they cinched the round and, you know, well played by Payable and well played by Cybers. It is, it is definitely a tough in a mirror depending on, on where you're, you're at. And he did miss quite a few cards in terms of his draws, which in a mirror is just huge. Do you think Payable can cinch the reverse sweep though? Oh boy, it's going to be an interesting one. What an upset that'll be for the first game of the day to get reverse swept. Um, Cybers versus Payable. There are two teammates. They do have very similar deck lists as well. So it's going to be interesting to see how that ends up unfolding. Will we see the reverse sweep in the first game of the day? Let's see. Yeah, Syndicate versus Northern Realms. Syndicate, do they have enough answers for some of the you know, big power plays? You do have the Philippa. I feel, feel like Philippa is one of the vital cards in this matchup for Syndicate. If you can find Pepper and you can steal an Ana 
or another you know valuable engine and get that over to your side of the board that can absolutely destroy northern realms if they don't have options to deal with it, it can also be quite it can also be quite difficult because I believe this Northern Realms deck does in fact run that bomb heaver. So you know this Passiflora probably won't be that valuable as long as um, as long as Cybus is able to find that bomb heaver or a Neuromancy. Now we do see Pyable will be on red coin as we um, expected, and he will be up against Cybus. So these won't be any coin for the abuse against the Spectre real quick. This is where uh, Blood Money also does really well uh, versus other leader abilities for syndicate because there are so many good targets for you to remove so having the option of you know eight points of damage that kills a frigate that sinks the boat so you've yep. got good options against this deck where amphibious assault can you know make some things more difficult to remove yep that is very true i'm um, having that having that uh easy access to leaderability just to answer something and develop your own engine is so powerful and that's one of the good things about blood money is not only are you able to answer an opponent's threat but because it's your leaderability you can also develop your own threat at the same time so you can play like a pass for it and use leaderability at the same time or you can play something like i don't know maybe a um mk and use leader at the same time turn you get to do two things at once which we've, we know is a very powerful thing in Gwent. you know being able to do two things at once has always been so valuable that's why i think like pincer maneuver second win have always been such strong leader abilities in the past Yep, so Cyber's playing his friggin' frigate there and being very swiftly poisoned. That's why you don't play the TA, you know, straight away when you're playing against Syndicate, because you just play into their strategy. Uh, but he has set up the soldier pocket just in case the frigate doesn't get answered. He clicked the frigate, and there's another mutated hound very quickly coming down to poison the crew, sink the boat. Uh, but Cyber does have a second frigate in hand, so he could opt to play it right into that soldier pocket and yep. protect it a little bit with the uh, raw guard. Yeah, and we do see that that Pyable is out of poisons, which means that the only way he can really stop up some of this um, frigate value is with the likes of the Tin Boy. But Tin Boy in this matchup, I must say, should find some pretty good value. You know, there is no likes of Voimir to try to protect these um, these volunteers with some armor, which means that Tin Boy in this matchup, you would expect to find some pretty insane value um, against these frigates. Yeah, the, the frigates do get kind of messed up by Tinboy. Tinboy is it's also a nice tech against things like Ethereal, and we did see a lot of Ethereal yesterday. So opting to run that in your Syndicate when, I guess, row stacking is quite prevalent at the moment, I think is a good tech choice. Although he is, what, 12 provisions? Like, he's an expensive boy. Yep, very expensive card, in fact. But also a very impactful one when it does find its mark. And I think in this matchup, it definitely will find some value. And uh, let's see what Cyber is going to do here, as he does have quite a few bronze in hand, but he does have the Royal, not the Royal Decree, but rather the Bomb Heaver available for whenever the Passive Flora is committed from um, Pyable. So that's always very nice to have in hand when you are up against scenario decks such as this. This round one hand for Pyable is really quite awkward, though. He had three spenders. He has the Urchin. He has two Sea Jackals. Like, that's not what you want in a round one. You want to be able to get up, hopefully, to um, nine coins and, and go from there. Uh, Pyable opting to use the shield there on MK. What do you think? I um, guess it's play around Boiling Oil. Obviously, Cybers does play with Boiling Oil. Um, it does play a little bit into Heat Wave, I guess you could say, but that protection against Boiling Oil, I think, makes a lot of sense. So that is why that he's... Uh, obviously, against Northern Realms, a lot of the time, that shield is quite valuable as well, because it also protects against things like Unsayers. So, ooh, the Triumph <laughs> Infantry pinging the MK shield. That's definitely not what you want to be seeing for Pyable. Now Pyable's going to have, to have the threat of the boiling oil um, once again. Yeah, that uh, Trident ping effectively worth three coins. So, you know, in terms of your, yeah. your average value, that is pretty nice. Uh, the other options also, there's some armor on the board and stuff. So in terms of where else you could have gone, that ping was pretty nasty. The thing here is we've seen two frigates get played, right? So after this round, Ten Boy is losing a lot of his value, whereas Pyable in terms of his hand state, he's got a spender on the board already, and he's got two more spenders, and he has sod all money. Like, he's not being very financially sensible in terms of saving. <laughs> so this round one's really awkward, because you want to wait with your Tin Boy. But what do you play here? You know, you can play the Jackal, and then you gain two coins from MK, but you're still only on four coins. You haven't thinned your Redanian. You don't have enough money to play Soul. And then your other options are Adriano and uh, Seductress, and it's quite late for that. I would imagine what Pyable is going to do is going to, as long as he has reached with Tin Boy, he's going to keep contesting this round. That's what my guess would be. However, you know, with these engines going off for so much points per turn for Cybers, the gap is getting wider and wider and more and more difficult for Pyable to threaten that reach. However, Pyable is earning two coins a turn with this MK for the time being, and that is going to maybe give him some footing in this round to stay in it. But, you know, 
three points turn on this tri well two points turn on this tritum um and drummer inf uh, combo as well as this two points turn on frigate you know cyber's going four points turn right now pieball only earning two yeah pieball it's just it's such an awkward situation because like you said he has the threat with the tin boy but he needs to play other cards to stay in the round and he's kind of starting to run out of things like a slice of Ductress, you know sixth card into a round isn't really where you want to go with this and cyber's you know he does have options to kind of answer that if he wishes with the uh... although actually no it would be a five right if you play on says you'd have yeah, to use a leader charge leader charge which i don't think cyber's want to do in round one yeah. and then you play I mean, into tin boy <laughs> This is shortening round two quite a bit, and the shorter round two becomes the harder it becomes for Fireball to bleed because obviously with a lot, with so many ends like Sal, Passiflora, whatnot, um, you really need a longer round to get any kind of pressure going. So the longer round one goes, the more difficult it becomes for Fireball to you know mount any type of aggressive push in round number two. So let's see what Fireball decides to do here as there is pretty big point gap right now. And um, yeah, Cyber is just passing. Like doesn't want to play cards. any more cards. Uh, Tin Boy, I believe, with some spend should be enough because. Although there's a lot of armor enough. there. Depends where these pings I, go as well a little bit. I certainly hope it's enough. I hope Pyreball is doing the math on this one because this could be a problem if it isn't enough. I'm going to assume it is, but my goodness, if it's not, there's a big problem. So he's 15, I think, on Tin Boy plus your spend. But then your opponent's getting three per turn. It depends maybe a little bit where the ping goes. And you do have six coins in the bank, uh, which is, I guess, six points. But the point gap... At the moment, 19 points, so you need 20, but then that's not taking into account the pings. So let's find out. Let's find out. There is the Tin Boy. Uh. Eh. Uh. Uh. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Oh, doing the maths. I mean, now you can pass? I guess, I guess <laughs> Fireball was hoping that one of the pings would hit armor, but man, that's a pretty big gamble to take. Oh boy, so Pyeball now two cards down. <laughs> that is a bit of a problem. So he can't really push. He, can't he has to pause. But now Cybus gets both first say and last say. And he has the Heaver. Extremely scary. I mean, the draw is not bad. You've got the Passiflora, you've got the Azure, so you have some kind of options in that turn. But Cybers, two cards up, draws into Baron and Eggmund, our good friend Eggy Boy over here. So. You you can't really shorten the round here, and you don't really want to with things like soul, but ooh, Tin Boy, yeah. reach but not reach enough. That was a really nice yeah. pass from Cyber. I, I, I imagine Pyeball, if he did the math, that he was hoping that random ping would hit armor, which is a bit of a gamble to take, but didn't pay off for Pyeball here as he now finds himself a card, two cards down. And he's going to have to pass here, I think, and then go a card down to round number three. And, I mean, Cybers has the bomb heaver. He's got a pretty good hand so far. And I just don't know what Cybers, what Pyeball is going to be able to do against both first say and last say in favor of um, Cybers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe you hope that if you if you play into this round, you can just get anyway. some things out. Yeah, because it does, you know, Cybers points do take a little bit of setup. Uh, but then if you lose this, going two cards down, you're going to be incredibly sad. The other thing is the passive floor is really awkward. You know, you might want to try and play it round two and hope that they don't have Heva. But when your opponent is also running a Neuromancy, they do have that extra access. So it's very likely in this situation that uh, you do have that option. Eggman's being utilized to squash the bug. He's a nice damage <laughs> option. Like, you don't have to always play him as a drummer. So the bug has been squashed. But, you know, Pyeball does have the option to pass. Is an Azar for an Eggman trade? that good though yeah. and this has been a, such a weird game in round number one so the question is what does Pyeball decide to do here he's got six coins in the bank he's got so many engines the problem is how does Pyeball push like every card in hand is an engine like it, it you just don't you, you don't have enough time to see them all but he's gonna go for the pass for anyway Cybers has got the bomb heaver but man this is looking so awkward but I mean I guess we can if he's able to put down enough threats it could be it might become a little bit awkward for Cybers to answer enough of them but here's the bomb heaver that unfortunately round two just so short for Pyeball these engines aren't going to be nearly as threatening as they would be in a long round I think Pyeball just had to really hope that Cybers didn't have access to bomb heaver in that situation and it is much more likely in round two than in round three you know it's because if cybers has found bomb heaver by now he'll keep it but but round three you draw into three more cards right so so it is one of those things and now uh cybers is ahead with two cards 
Yeah, I mean, it's not just it's not just the bomb heaver that Cyber has, it's a Neuromancy too. Hoping that your opponent misses out on a Neuromancy and bomb heaver. A little bit, a little bit far fetched, but I mean, I guess maybe Cyber's Cyber trying to look for some. This is just the heat wave, right? Yeah, you just snap the heat wave. You don't boost the Seductress, and you stay ahead. And now, I guess you can get another Seductress. I mean, you've got the tempo. Your leader isn't really great. You don't have a spender, so you may as well save that money. Uh, but in doing this, you know, twenty-one points to thirteen. I mean, Cybers might just go all leader charges and take the double and take the double final set with two card advantage in round three, perhaps. Maybe that's what we'll see Cybers do. Just commit like a round of a draw guard, go all leader charges or something like that, and just say, you know what? I'll have no leader, but I'll have two cards up on you yeah. and double final set. I think even the surrender you could afford to commit now because it's not going to be that good uh, in a three card round, right? So at the moment you're getting six points from it. Plus you then have the leader charges and the the Scytheman. Uh, it's, it's a good option. You have to do the math so with the seductresses and stuff and work out exactly what gets you ahead. Okay. I'm gonna go for the Baron plus the boost then I guess that that should do it. So looks like Cyber's gonna use another leader charge here. And I mean, yeah, double <laughs> final say, two card advantage. This is looking like a little bit of a GG in my opinion. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what top big fireball to have to find. I mean, he's got Philippa, he's got Pickpocket, which can be quite nice. It will too, but Cyber still has Fallible, still has a Neuromancy, still has Wizard God and, the, and two cards up against Fireball, yikes. He just, Pyre also spent so much in that round, and what did he really bleed out? Not all that much. He got Eggmund, you know, he got Ansays, he got Baron, he got Heatwave, so big targets, but you're still two cards down. So even then, it's like your opponent could, you know, have a couple bronzes and it equates to the state of the hand. Fireball, though, in terms of how his hand could be, I think that is the best it could be. Yeah, I would say so. That is definitely as strong as you could hope for, but... Is it going to be enough? I'm not entirely sure. There's the ill plus leader ability, and Cyber's now. I mean, I guess he can't kill the ill. Well, he can play a Neuromancy, I guess, onto a Boiling Oil. That could kill it if he really wants to, but um, then he must then he can't lose out on the Fallible or the Anna, I guess. But let's see what Cyber decides to do. I don't think Cyber is that worried about this, however, but because Fireball spender, does have follow right? up anyway, the spender. Mm. Yeah, but follow up. So it's not the end of the world if if um if Cyber or Fireball loses out on the ill. With the card advantage, I wonder if there's a situation where you would a Neuromancy oil and then discard a card so that your opponent has absolutely no targets for spending. I guess then he'd have to find a spender with bank. Like sometimes there are situations where if you play uninteractively, your opponent is pretty sad. And I think dealing with Ewald when your opponent has seven cards in hand and they played so many spenders is kind of worth it. Oh, this is nice too. I like this. Again, you're just being un an uninteractive friendo. Yeah, I mean, this follow-up might end up being a big card. Pyreball, I mean, Cybers could, as you mentioned, just discard his Radovid Royal Guard and say, have fun with all your coins. Yeah. Um, I guess a prime defender is very valuable for Pyreball. But if, if Pyre saves his money here, if Cybers just a Neuromancy's the boiling oil and kills the street urchin, Ewald can't shoot anything, Philippa can't steal anything, so you've got nine dead coins. No, because we have the street urchin, right? No, if he kills it. So he plays a Neuromancy into or the into the it. boiling oil, uh, kills no, the urchin. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, mean, could do that. you're tempted to Fallible in this board state, right? This board state is such a tempting Fallible. But when mm. your opponent has nine coins and you know Philippa is a card, that is a thing. But, like, Cybers doesn't, like, he doesn't need to take a risk. He could afford to just be boring. Oh, he's gone yeah, for Fallible. Like like is this gonna be? I mean, he could spend coins with on um, spend a leader charge on the Fallible to put it out of Philippa range. It I wouldn't guess. be out of Philippa range. It'd be an eight, and he's got nine coins. All right, never mind. Right, never mind. I thought it was seven coins. My bad. So yeah, I mean, I guess it just goes. Um, it's just gonna be Philippa food, but I think it doesn't really matter. Could have been interesting if he took the um, boiling oil, but uh, I guess famous words are. I think in the end, it doesn't even matter, unfortunately. But definitely could have been an interesting play for Cybers to make use of. Yeah, opting, opting to play. At the end of the day, you're two cards up, but I, I like the idea of leaving Pyreball with nine coins and, and a dead Philippa, because it's not something that you see you see very often. So, looks like that is going to be game over. P Cyber's almost getting reverse swept from Pyreball. Must say, Pyreball did a good job at staying in the game, despite being 2-0 down, um, but then obviously did actually end up taking the final game there. Um, Pyreball with a very interesting gamble in round one with a with a tin boy definitely could have backfired potentially if um well it did backfire but it it, it was very risky for Pyball to take that that, that risk and fortunately did not end up paying off and he was on top of two card or, or did find himself two cards down after round one but congratulations to cybers for winning that game a little bit of a tlg death match there 
as Cybers will move on to the second round of the winner's bracket. Um, and Pybal will, of course, progress to the loser's bracket now, where he will still battle his way to try and make it back to the finals of the loser's bracket. But we'll have to see if he's going to be able to do that or not. So there you have it. What did you think of the games? You know, what was your favorite moment between them? How do you feel like the different factions performed? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoy this sort of video, you can always leave a like on the video. Uh, beyond that, you can find me on Twitter at Jagras and Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Jagras. You can find Spiro on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Spiro underscore ZA. And you can find Team Leviathan Gaming at teamleviathangaming.com. Uh, to find out more about what they do. They do a lot of things like meta reports, big tournaments like this, and all sorts of Gwenty cool stuff. Beyond that, have an awesome, awesome day, and hopefully I'll catch you in the next video.